Howdy, everyone. How's everyone doing after lunch? Excellent. Um, so I'm going to talk about our HABS program. And I'm just the one that is currently kind of at the helm of it. Um, but I'm standing on some really big shoulders that establish the program, such as Hank Van de Plug, as well as Julie Dybel and others um, that were here before me um, here at Glural establishing this program. And when I went to go start the abstract of this, I looked at the date and I was like, oh my goodness, it's been 10 years since the Toledo water crisis. Um, so I kind of want to look at, or I'm going to go through some of Glural's research and how us and our partners have kind of developed how we look at the HAB in Lake Erie since um, 2014. So I'm not going to go into great detail on this. Um, I'm going to introduce the subject. Hopefully, it may be. Um, I don't need to go into detail in this crowd of what the Toledo water crisis was. Um, but in August of 2014, there was a do not drink order that was um, put out for the city of Toledo and parts of Michigan, lower Michigan as well, um, to not drink the water because amount of a uh, certain amount of toxin from microcystis blooms had gotten into the water system and they wanted to make sure no one got sick. Um, after it shut down the water for approximately three days, and just to remind everyone, water is an essential nutrient that we all need to live. And a lot of the people that were living in Toledo at the time rely on municipality type water in order to do that. So this was really a human health crisis on a scale that um, we haven't seen really at, as a large of a population here in the United States as well as, as opposed to other areas. And this was due to a combination of factors that I'm not really going to go into today, um, as there's other papers that go into that and other things. Um, we were out there with our partners at Sigler um, monitoring the bloom like we did every year. We started the long-term monitoring in 2012, um, uh, similar to how it is established now. And I think I have a pointer here. Um, so we were out looking at these different sites that I have over here. And you can see this is the green bar here is when the do not drink order um, was uh, issued and right in between those, we did see large amounts of toxin just west of um, the Toledo water intake and then also after where it was really, really toxic out there. And I should also point out that these are the recreational and drinking water limits. Um, so overall, 2014 was a, a pretty toxic year. Um, I'm going to focus a little bit on this WE2 site. So I just wanted to point out where that was, which is right outside the um, Maumee River plume. So since then, we've been looking at flow and how the flow has been coming out of the Maumee River. And this is some of the work done by Craig Stowe and his colleagues um, at Glural of looking at how phosphorus is changing. And we know for one that the um, flow coming out of the Maumee has been increasing. Um, and one point, thing are important to note here is this has really been driven by extreme events. So we are seeing an increase in those quick, intense periods of extreme events that come down and cause this flow to go up. Um, what what were interesting when we normalize um, the amount of phosphorus that is coming out is that we're starting to see a slight decrease in this overall phosphorus um, load into the system um, since about 2010. Phosphorus is great. It's very important to the bloom. I'm not also going to go into that because I could spend my entire time just talking about how phosphorus impacts the bloom. We also have to note that nitrogen is important to the bloom and especially to the toxicity of the bloom. Um, what um, colleagues have shown, um, Sylvia Newell um, in her 2019 paper uh, showing that there is a change in the ratios of the nitrogen species and that it's going to a more reduced form which then can help um, contribute to that toxicity and really that health effects of the bloom. And I'll go into a little bit more of that in a little bit, maybe. Does it want to go for it? Ah, sorry for the technical difficulties. It doesn't like that slide. <laughs> there we go. It's because this is really big. This is a lot of data and I apologize for it, but it's really cool data. Um, so one of the aspects in which we've developed is um, having several real-time buoys out within the ecosystem. Um, and right now they're at four established sites. This is with Steve Rupert and Russ Miller at Sigler um, that go out there and put these real-time buoys out every year. Um, and one of the things that they have on there is a cycle piece so that we can look at how phosphorus is changing. And this is phosphorus at that WE2 site. The dots are the phosphorus where the bars are the different types of phytoplankton. That kind of greenish 
blue one is the blue green algae and the brown bar is the diatoms. And what we see is when phosphorus year after year as phosphorus drops out of that system, that's when we see the cyanobacteria kind of take over and dominate within that system. Um, so the, again, this is from 2015 to um, just this past year. So using advanced technologies such as um, these real-time buoys are really helping us explain how the bloom is developing and how it's changing. We've also been able um, to change how we look at forecasts. Um, and this is combining not only ecological um, models and biogeochemical models, but also with experiments that we're doing in the lab and what we're seeing in the field itself. Um, so Hank Vanderplug and um, Paul Denial did a study back in 2019 um, where they looked at the buoyancy of the bloom. So these blooms move throughout the water column. They brought this in, did an experiment to see how fast the bloom was moving in the water column. So the velocity going up and down. Um, and not only that, when this was occurring based off of the light, this was then put into models um, that Mark Rowe helped develop or developed. Um, also looking at how the bloom was moving within the system um, and, and where in the water column the bloom was located at. And why this is really key is when we get to forecasting of where the bloom is going to be in the future. And that's what our colleagues at NCOS have been able to do. They've taken um, this work and have made it operational, uh, which hopefully these movies will play. Awesome. Um, they've now, based off of this seminary work, they've been able to now look at how the bloom is moving at the surface. And then also throughout the entire integrated water column, taking this data. Um, from there, they've also been able to then um, predict where scums might form. And why scums is important is the location of high amounts of toxin of where that human um, toxin relationship is most likely at the highest and where we want to warn people where to avoid the most. I mentioned earlier that we have a long-term uh, monitoring program. Um, I showed a little video of it or a picture of it earlier. We have expanded this monitoring program to include several more sites now. And we have um, lots of discrete samples that we are currently increasing what we just uh, sample every week when we go out there, because we're finding that more and more stuff is important to understand the bloom dynamics. We also have continuous sampling that we're doing, which I mentioned with the buoys. Um, I, one thing that is not on here, we also have a now transect, which we take from the Detroit River, all the way into this WE2 site that we do once a month. Um, right now, looking at that dynamic between a non-bloom location into a bloom location. Um, and as I mentioned, we do this starting in July weekly. Right now we're out there every other week. We started in April. Um, and I can also tell you, it is very hot out there. Last uh, Earlier this week on Monday when they were out, it was 23 degrees C in the water. That's very warm. I don't remember that doesn't work. All right, some of the things that we are seeing um, out of this um, now over 12 year data set is, is that the bloom is starting earlier. Um, so this was a little unexpected. Um, and what I mean by the first occurrence of the bloom is really when we first see particulate toxin, because that's what I'm interested in. And that's what is going to affect human health, not necessarily what the satellites might be picking up on how much bloom is in the water. So this is the first occurrence of particulate toxin that we are seeing during our um, monitoring program. And as you can see, hopefully kind of a little bit, <laughs> if you squint, um, is that we are seeing a slight increase in when, um, based off of the weeks per year, um, when the toxin is showing up in the water column. And last year, it was very early of the 15th of May was the first time we saw that toxin and we were out. Um, this also is corresponding to cooler water. Not what we were expecting. I just mentioned it's very hot out there. Hot does not necessarily equal bloom. And I have a little bit more on that here in a second um, to kind of explain what we are thinking of, is going on here a little bit. We're also seeing dissolved toxins. So there's two different fractions to that toxin. There's the particulate, the toxin that is inside the cells, and then the dissolved that is outside the cells. That dissolved fraction we know is new thanks to um, research done at Ohio State and Justin Chaffin, that the toxin gets broken down really, really quickly. So we know dissolved toxin is new or pre recently produced toxin, then we see it in the water column as the cells lice and break open. So if you're blue, that means dissolved show up, showed up first. If you're a longer blue, it showed up even 
um, earlier within the year. If you're red, particulate showed up first. Again, length is gonna tell you how early it showed up um, within, our, uh, within the system of the Western Basin. And what we've seen basically since 2019, hopefully, is that dissolved toxin is showing up a lot earlier and throughout the system. So we know the bloom is there, we're just not seeing it in the water column. Dissolved also stays within the um, system for longer than the particulate. And we're thinking this is all leading to that earlier development of the bloom, I should say. Um, so this is a, another busy slide, um, and I apologize for that, but I'll walk you through it. Um, we're also seeing something that's slightly, um, what I didn't expect, is that it appears that the bloom is becoming less toxic. Um, in that, these are the two recreational limits. So we have the recreational limit and the drinking water limit up top. And over time, what we are seeing that um, our, the times that we are out there, the percentage is when it exceeds that limit is that we are um, redu reducing the potential of when we see that limit um, being exceeded out in the field. However, a very important caveat to this is, is we go out once a week, maybe twice. So we might be missing a lot of that toxic period. And I'll get to that in a second with some of our advanced technology development. Maybe. It must have really big slides. Um, so another thing that we're using is omics tools. So this is one of um, the omics tools that we're looking at is metabolite differences. And what I mean by this is the conjures of the toxins themselves. They have different toxicities that then relate back to the human health effect on this. So LA or microcystin LA is the most toxic, um, where microcystin LW is much less toxic um, than LA. And what we're seeing is that though our systems are dominated by LR and RR, we are getting some of that LA, which is this yellow, which isn't showing up as well as I hoped um, within our system. So our system is becoming more toxic to human health potentially. Also through omics tools, what we are seeing is the bloom dynamics are changing and that even just in the cyanobacteria community. So specifically looking at 2019 is the one that I like to pull out. While our blooms have mostly have been dominated by microcystis and still continue to be, delicospermum is starting to make more of an appearance. So the bigger the dot, the more that it's represented. And then these are um, throughout the year at different sites going down. So we're seeing delicospermum come into the system and be present throughout the bloom period. This is important because delicospermum creates a different type of toxin than microcystins. They can create microcystins as well, but a more potent, more deadly neurotoxin that it can also potentially produce. So we need to be on a lookout of how the toxin and how the bloom might be changing because of it. So I mentioned before, um, we're only out once a week. Wouldn't it be nice if we could get out more often? Well, luckily, we've been developing some advanced technologies at Glural um, with our partners at NCOS to do just that. And this is using an Ambari device known as the Environmental Sample Processor, um, where we have two of them that sit out in Lake Erie and do near real-time toxin um, analysis. And what I mean by near real-time, within an hour and a half of water being collected, we know how much toxin is out in the system. It does the ELISA that we do out back in the lab just out in the field for us. And this is um, data from 2023, so last year. And what we were able to capture with this higher increase of um, going out there and sampling, this daily sampling, is almost a 650-fold increase in toxin over just a 48-hour period. That's a big jump in the toxin because things are changing so quickly and where the bloom is moving. So this type of data is really helping us be able to get to our stakeholders and let them know um, what's going on within the system. We're also developing um, hyperspectral imaging and aerial photographs. Um, and this allows us to de um, determine where these hot spots are of where the bloom can be developing. A lot of times, We've all been in the Great Lakes, right? It's cloudy during the summer. It's really hard to get a good satellite image. Hyperspectral gives us a way to get under those clouds as well as really get close up to shore and get a good understanding of what's going on in that system. I was worried that you were about to stand up. <laughs> um, good thing I'm almost done. All right, so um, we're taking these images, which we get uh, a base image here, are able to pull out the cyanobacteria and then really key in where the hot spots are located. 
we can now combine these two different types of advanced technologies and we're getting there. So this is the 2G ESP, which I talked about previously that we put out at two different sites. We have also tested a 3G, which is just a, one of these shrunken down to sit into a long range AUV. This is Ambari's long range AUV. We've tested this for three years and Greg um, Dick tomorrow, will talk a little bit about this research of what we found, but hopefully we all know our blooms are also really close to shore. And this is where the human interaction really is the highest with our blooms. Wouldn't it be great if we could get into shallow areas because this sucker is not gonna get in there. It needs at least three meters of water to get into. Well, luckily we're testing a uncrewed um, surface vehicle known as the Sea Track. When we put the 3G ESP into the Sea Track, we call it the shark, which is the surface, um, surface harmful algal research craft. There, I had to remember that acronym. So um, the shark goes out, goes to the swimming areas, um, gets um, toxic readings again, near real time toxin analysis within two hours of how toxic it is out there. Last year during our deployment, seven different times we were able to record above the drinking water limits within these shallow water areas. That's really key because when people are out there swimming, they're not paying attention if the water is going in their mouths or not. So we're combining these two things with the hyperspectral imaging and the sea track and um, the long range AUV where we can get three dimensional ideas of not only the toxin, but what's going on within the ecosystem and the bloom itself, where we're able to mow the lawn to get where the hot spots are and then send these vehicles out to where there might be high amounts of toxin, which is what we did last year. This is a mow the lawn hyperspectral. We noticed this hot spot. We sent the sea track there. And this is what we saw, nice scummy water to then be able to go sample. So future of HABs and future research in Lake Erie. Um, we've started to move the needle. We start really have um, learned a lot in the last 10 years, but we still have a long way to go. And especially within the field of climate change and how climate is going to impact the bloom. Um, that's a really unknown. We also have this new problem of aerosolized toxins. We don't know how, um, the, our systems as human systems are breathing in the toxins and how it's affecting us. I, I know um, colleagues at University of Toledo that are looking at that. We also need to start looking at overall bloom life cycle. The bloom's down there in the winter, just is. We need to start looking at that and knowing what's going on during that period so that we can help better predict what's going to happen in the future. Lots of thank yous. I'm sure I missed someone. So if I missed you, I am sorry. And I don't know if I have time for questions. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I think we've got time for one quick question. So Craig, hold your hand down, um, <laughs> but anybody else? Yeah, go right ahead. Hey, Reagan. I know that you guys go through and measure a lot of parameters um, what do you do to measure light? And is there a sensor that continuously measures light? And how many do you guys have around? <laughs> um, we use car sensors um, to do that. And we are going to start, we have them out above the water. Um, this year, we're going to go start putting them below the water as well. Um, on the 3G or 2G ESP landers, we're going to put one at the surface and at the bottom to start to look at some of the attenuation going on. Where, where is that located? Um, we have one at our WE8 site, which is on the Michigan coast, and the other one is near Little Cedar Point. Oh, okay. Um, right by the water tank. Oh, nice. Yes. Yeah. So Why couldn't you put, when, when were those put in? Those will get put in in July. 